Welcome to lecture 19. This is a lecture where we're going to be talking about some more degenerate perturbation theory examples. We're going to cover the Stark effect for the hydrogen atom. That's the hydrogen atom in an external electric field. And we're going to give a spin example of perturbation theory as well. All right, so for the hydrogen atom in an external field, we take as our H0 the full hydrogen Hamiltonian, p squared over 2 mu minus e squared over r. The fine structure Hamiltonian is minus 1 eighth p to the fourth over mu cubed c squared plus 1 half h bar over mc quantity squared L dot s times e squared over r cubed. In this case, we're using that Gottfried normalization where L is equal to L over h bar. The electric field perturbation from the Stark effect is given by the electric charge E, the electric field epsilon dot R. If we take the electric field along the Z direction, that becomes E epsilon Z, and we can write that as E epsilon R cos theta. So what are the good quantum numbers on this? This is always where you start when you are thinking about doing perturbation theory. For the initial Hamiltonian, L squared and LZ, S squared and SZ, and J squared and JZ, they all commute with the Hamiltonian. When we add the fine structure, we figured out that it's the J squared JZ basis that is the one that is the valid basis to do the expansion in because those quantum numbers are good. So that means that L squared, S squared, J squared, and JZ commute with V fine structure. So if we add H0 plus V fine structure, those are good quantum numbers. But now when we look at the Stark effect, neither L squared nor J squared commute with Z, with the coordinate operator Z. And that means that we're left just with S squared and JZ as the good quantum numbers. Okay, now V Stark has odd parity because it's proportional to Z. So it will only connect states with different parity. You know that it's odd parity because if you take all of your coordinates and all of your momenta and switch the sign, so in V Stark, that would mean Z goes to minus Z. If it stays the same sign, it's even. If it changes sign, it's odd. If it goes to something else, then it doesn't have definite parity. So because V Stark has odd parity, it can only connect states with different parity, which means they have to have different L values. Now, since the ground state is an S wave, there's no linear Stark, sh Stark shift because the ground state can't connect to itself. But for n larger than or equal to 2, different L values are degenerate, which means first order shifts are possible. And that first order shift is called the linear Stark effect. The ground state can have a quadratic shift. That's called the quadratic Stark effect. And we're going to discuss that next. So for the ground state, we have n equals 1, l equals 0, s equals a half, and j equals a half. And we have a degeneracy with mj equals plus or minus a half. mj is a good quantum number, which means that there's nothing that can couple to it, so there's no first order shift. To get the second order shift, we have to just go to our perturbation theory. It's not really degenerate perturbation theory because mj is a good quantum number. So we already know the parallel bases in this subspace, it's the states with definite mj. So we simply have to take the overlap of some arbitrary state nj mjl, where n is bigger than or equal to 2 with our ground state, n equals 1, j equals a half, mj l equals 0, with the potential v stark sandwiched in between. We take the modulus squared of that, and then we divide it by e1 of 0 minus e and JL of zero. Now, the smallest value that that did not, so in general, this summation is a hard thing to calculate. You'd have to calculate every matrix element. You would have to calculate, you know, we know what all the energies are, but you'd have to calculate every one of those matrix elements, find out which ones are non-zero and sum only over those non-zero terms. And that can get to be pretty challenging to work out. However, the smallest value for the denominator occurs when n is equal to 2. And in that case, the denominator is proportional to e squared over a0. If you want to get the correct answer, it would be e squared over 2a0 minus e squared over 8a0. And the numerator is proportional to 
e squared epsilon naught squared a naught squared, because the expectation value of z should be on the order of the Bohr radius a naught. That means our shift in general is going to be on the order of epsilon squared times a0 cubed. Now, the absolute value or the magnitude of that will be less than or equal to what we would get if we just substituted in e2 of 0 instead of e n j l of 0. Now, that might sound like that's a bad approximation to put in, but if you think about it, the energy levels go up relatively quickly from 1 to 2, but then when I go from 2 to 3 and 3 to 4 and so forth, those energy levels start really piling up close to zero. So it's actually not an incredibly bad approximation to do this. And if we do that, then a miracle occurs because we can then factor out the denominator because it no longer depends on n, j, and l. We just set it equal to the value that it had when n is equal to two. And now what you can see is you have a completeness sum there. It's a completeness sum with every term except the term that would correspond to n equals one. So all we have to do is we can replace that sum by 1 minus the term when n equals 1. So we can then get rid of that summation. The case where n equals 1, we don't have to worry about because when n equals 1, that expectation value is equal to 0. So we can get rid of the restriction on the summation, have it the sum go freely over all possible terms, and then we can get rid of the summation and those two terms in the middle because of the completeness expression. And we find we have an expectation value in the ground state of z squared. Now you can go ahead and calculate that expectation value. It turns out it's equal to a0 squared. As I mentioned before, when you look at that difference, e1, 0 minus e2, 0, you get 3 eighths e squared over a0. And when you put all that together, you find that, that the expression on the right hand side becomes 8 thirds epsilon squared a0 cubed and the shift is going to be smaller than that in fact the shift should be pretty close to that given the argument that we gave before okay so this method is similar to the method of dalgarno and lewis which if you're interested in what that method is you go take a look in shift's textbook on page 266 it's an interesting way of doing the summation of second order perturbation theory in cases where you can find special operators that have particular commutation relations with the Hamiltonian. And the, in the shift, they give you an example where you can use this method of Dalgarno and Lewis in order to do the summation. All right, let's focus now on the strong field limit. In the strong field limit, we're gonna neglect the fine structure. And the first non-trivial case corresponds to n equals two. Remember there we have j equals 3 halves and j equals 1 half. We have the three different sets of states, the 2p3 halves, the 2p1 half, and the 2s1 half. The states in the 2p3 halves that have mj equals plus or minus 3 halves, they have no linear shift because mj is a good, good quantum number. That means that they can't couple to anything else except the state that has mj equals 3 halves. But there's only one state with mj equals 3 halves. And because v stark has odd parity, it can't couple a state to itself, so all those linear shifts are zero for the mj equals three half states. For mj equals plus or minus one half, we can mix the p and the s states. Now we have three states that have mj equals a half, the p three halves, the p one half, and the s one half, so there'll be a non-zero matrix element between the p one half and the s one half, and between the p three halves and the s one half, but there'll be no non-zero matrix element between the p3 halves and the p1 half. That matrix element must be zero. Now, it also turns out that we only have to do the calculation for mj equals plus a half because the results will be degenerate with the results for mj equals minus a half. And that's a result that comes from time reversal invariance. It, these states form what are called Cromer's doublets. I don't have the time in this class to go into detail about how time inverse, reversal invariance guarantees that that holds, so you'll just have to trust me that that occurs. But that means that we only have to do the calculation for the mj equals plus one half case. All right. Now, so as we said, in the degenerate subspace, all of those energy values are exactly the same. There's a zero matrix element when we look at the p states. So we're looking at the p3 halves, p1 half, and s1 half as we look at the three rows or three columns of that matrix. The P states don't overlap, so we get a zero for that matrix element. And then we have two matrix elements, one with the S overlapping with the P3 halves, that we call A, and one where the 
S overlaps with the P1 half that we call B. Now the only difference if we included the fine structure is those E2 of zero states on the top, the first one would become E2 three halves and the second one would become E2 one half because the fine structure is diagonal in this basis. And we're gonna actually go through and talk about that after we go through this analysis. I just want you to see that that change is actually relatively simple. All right, so if we go ahead and do the calculation and you have to actually get out the wave functions and do the integral, I'm not gonna take you through that algebra. It's a little bit painful, but not so bad. If you want to do it, of course, you're free to go ahead and check it out and do it and see how that works. What you have to do is you have to actually work with the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients to make sure you have the exact linear combinations of spatial and spin states, and then you have to work out the different overlaps. What we find is A is equal to minus square root of 6A0 E epsilon, and B is the square root of 2 smaller, minus square root of 3A0 E epsilon. That means we can rewrite our matrix in the form, and we're going to now be looking at getting the eigenvalues. So we're going to look at the determinant of E20 minus E0A, 0, 0 E20 minus E1 over square root of 2A, A1 over square root of 2A, E20 minus E. We go ahead and calculate that determinant. We'll get an E20 minus E cubed minus E20 minus E times the quantity A squared times three halves, and that whole thing is equal to zero. We can easily factor out an E20 minus E from that, and then we have a quadratic equation that we have to solve, but it's a relatively simple one because it's E20 minus E squared is equal to A squared uh, three halves. That means that when we take the square root, I'm gonna get E2, I'm gonna get E is equal to E20 plus or minus A times root three over two. So those are the other two roots. We substitute in what A is and we get E, to zero plus or minus three A zero E epsilon. And this is what you would get in the strong field limit. One of the states won't shift, the other two, one shifts up, one shifts down by a very specific amount proportional to the field. Now, if we go ahead and look at the weak field limit where we're gonna put in the fine structure, the only thing that changes, as I had mentioned before, is we now have an E three halves, E one half, E one half. You go ahead and calculate the determinant and you find that it's a little bit more complicated here. Nothing factorizes out, so you need to solve to get all of the roots. You know, you can do this. The algebra is straightforward, but it's not particularly illuminating, so I'm not going to take you through that. Uh, in general, if I had to do this myself, I would throw this onto Wolfram Alpha because getting using, even though cubic equations can always be solved, trying to figure out how to work with the solutions of cubic equations is often a little bit painful. So... I would not really jump into figuring that out by hand myself, okay? All right, we're gonna end the lecture with another example. We're gonna look at a spin model where we have three spins that sit on a triangle. The spins are interacting by what is called the Heisenberg exchange interaction. You take the dot product of the spins on one site with the dot product of the spin on a neighboring site. Now, the dot product of the spins, remember, that's an S1x, an S1y, and an S1z. So S1 dot S2 is S1x, S2x, plus S1y, S2y, plus S1z, S2z. We do the same thing with sites 2 and 3, and the same things with sites 3 and 4. We multiply the whole thing by a number A, which is the Heisenberg exchange integral. And we're also putting it in a magnetic field, but our magnetic field is only on site 1. So we'll have a Zeeman splitting corresponding to a BS1Z, but only on site one, and we're working under the assumption that the B is small, so we're gonna be doing perturbation theory in the B. Now, you could go ahead and do the counting. Each site has the possibility of having a spin-up state or a spin-down state, so the total number of states is two times two times two, or eight states, and we can organize them just like we did with the N equals two case in terms of J equals three halves, and j equals one half. There are two sets of states that have j equals three halves. I'm sorry, one set of states that has j equals three halves. There are four states, and there are two sets of states that have j equals one half, which is two plus two, and the total is eight. Now, how do we get the states? Well, we're gonna do the construction just like we worked out in class. So we know that the j equals three halves, mj equals three halves is the state that has all spins up. To get the j equals three halves, mj equals one half, what do we do? We hit it with a lowering operator. Now, the lowering operator for spin one half is nice and simple. It just takes an upspin to a downspin. 
but I have the sum of that lowering operator on site one plus site two plus site three because it's a total spin operator. So I'm going to get a sum of three terms, one where I flipped the spin on the first site, one when I flipped it on the second, one where I flipped it on the third, and then I have to normalize that state. The normalization gives me a one over square root of three. I can go ahead and hit it with a lowering operator again, and here uh, some of the terms will be annihilated when you hit with a lowering operator. And when all the dust settles, you find that you will get down, down, up, plus down, up, down, plus up, down, down. You probably could have guessed that answer. They all come in with the same coefficient, so the 1 over square root of 3 over all of them. And then I can hit it with the lowering operator again, or I can just remember that the only possible state that has j equals 3 halves, mj equals minus 3 halves, is the all down state. Now, how do we get the j equals 1 half states? Well, they have to be perpendicular to this state that I got that has j equals 3 halves, mj equals 1 half. Because there are three states that have mj equals 1 half, there are two states that are perpendicular to that. So I just have to construct them, and we're constructing them with what are called the SU2 eigenvectors. So the first one, which is obvious to see, is I take one of the, the first term, I multiply it by 1, and the second term times minus 1, and then for normalization, I multiply by 1 over root 2. That is a vector that's perpendicular to the j equals 3 halves, mj equals 1 half state. We're going to call that state 1. I can get the state that goes with it by hitting with a lowering operator. And when you do that, you find you'll get 1 over root 2 down, up, down, minus, up, down, down. There's a cancellation that is occurring due to that minus sign. So you might want to carefully work that out for yourself to verify how that works. And now I have to get a state that's perpendicular to all three of those. And you see the clever construction is to give 1 for the first element, 1 for the second, and then to make it perpendicular to the third, I have to do a minus 2. See, the 1, 1 makes it perpendicular to the 1 state, and then the minus 2 makes it perpendicular to the first state that we had. And so we get down, up, up, plus up, down, up, minus 2, up, up, down. And we know that this works, and this is a state of definite j, because it has to be due to the fact that it's perpendicular to that other state. Normalization gives me a factor of 1 over square root of 6. You can go ahead and hit that with a lowering operator, and you get the state that is given for you there. All right. Now, when you want to calculate something that looks like s1.s2 plus s2.s3 plus s3.s1, where you're including all possible indices in all of the different dot products, you can actually write that, and this is an incredibly useful identity to remember, you can write that as one half the quantity s1 plus s2 plus s3 quantity squared minus the diagonal or direct terms, minus the s1 squared minus s2 squared minus s3 squared. You're then left with all the off-diagonal terms, and indeed all those off-diagonal terms are exact, exactly these dot products. In fact, you get each of them appearing twice, which is why we have a net of a one half that we have to put in. So now, though, we can then just evaluate the eigenstates. S squared is always 3 fourths for a spin 1 half system. So all of each of those guys are equal to 3 fourths. There are three of them, so I'll get a minus 9 fourths. And then the S1 plus S2 plus S3, that's the total J squared. So I just have to use the J eigenvalues. The J eigenvalues are 3 halves, so I'll get a 3 halves times 5 halves, or 1 half, so I'll get a 1 half times 3 halves. You go and work out that algebra, you get a then the whole thing times one half, you work out that algebra, you'll get a plus three fourths or a minus three fourths. Plus three fourths when it's j equals three halves, minus three fourths when it's j equals one half. So we have our unperturbed energies. Now, we're going to consider the state that has j equals one half, mj equals one half. This state is twofold degenerate, and we're going to be hitting it. The energy is minus three fourths a because it's a j equals one half state. We now have to look at the different matrix elements with the S1Z. Now, because all of these eigenstates as we've written them are eigenstates of the S1Z, the S1Z can be fairly straightforwardly calculated when we uh, work out these operator relationships. So when you go ahead and calculate this with the state one, let me remind you what the state one is. The state one is this state down, up, up, minus up, down, up. You see when the S1Z hits the first guy, it's going to give me a minus a half. And then when I take the overlap, that guy is going to have a non-zero matrix element with the corresponding bra from the other side. 
And when I look at the second term, it's going to give me plus a half, and that guy's going to have a non-zero overlap with the corresponding bra. So those overlaps are going to both be ones, but I have a minus one half with a plus one half. I end up getting a net of zero. So that first matrix element is zero, and then we have to calculate the overlap of the one with the two, and I'm working that out explicitly for you here. The one is expressed as the down, up, up, minus the up, down, up. It's times one over root two. And then the two state is one over root six times the uh, down, up, up, plus up, down, up, minus two, up, up, down. And we change the sign in front of that first term because that has a downspin in the S1 place, and we multiplied it by a half. And now you just have to take the matrix element between them. The down, up, up gets a minus one, and the up, down, up gets a minus one. So there's a net of minus two. The factors in front are one over four root three, so we get minus one over two root three. And then if you calculate the two S1, Z1, because the S1, Z operator is Hermitian, you just get the complex conjugate of what you just calculated. Since it's real, it's the same thing. And then we have to calculate the two S1, two, Again, you go through, you write out each of the different terms, you operate that S1, Z on it, and you find that you change the sign on one of the terms, that will give you a minus one, a plus one, and a plus four. That gives a net of one third. We end up with this matrix here, determinant of minus three fourths A minus E, minus B over two root three, minus B over two root three, minus three fourths A plus B over three minus E. We calculate the determinant, we get a quadratic equation, we solve the quadratic equation, we get these two different roots. And the two different roots simplify relatively nicely. They actually factorize perfectly. You can see that the AB cancels. You're going to get, and the A squared term cancels. So we're just left with that B squared term that has a perfect square root. So I'll just get plus or minus one third times the B. And indeed, we get this very simple answer, minus 3 fourths A plus 1 half B and minus 3 fourths A minus 1 sixth B. To calculate the second order, we need the matrix elements with J equals 3 halves because that's the only state that is outside of our degenerate subspace. We're not going to actually do that second order perturbation theory for you. We will, however, calculate the exact solution. So to get the exact solution, we, just need, we do need those matrix elements to get the exact solution. I'll let you think about how you do that, but you can see that that upper two by two block is the matrix that we just calculated because that is the part of the Hamiltonian in that degenerate subspace. And then there are these extra matrix elements with the J equals three halves case. You get a minus B over root six, you get a minus B over three root two, and then you get a diagonal element that is one sixth B. And now you would have to calculate this determinant and solve for the energy eigenvalues. It turns out that they factorize when you do that. I use Mathematica, and you can use Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha to do this. What you find is you get these three different energy eigenvalues. You get a minus 3 fourths A plus 1 half B. You get a minus 1 fourth square root of this complicated thing. And you get a plus 1 fourth square root of this complicated thing. Now... The minus 3 fourths A plus 1 half B, that is one of the energy eigenvalues that we got in our first order perturbation theory. And indeed, it turns out that is exact to all orders. When we look at the other two terms, one of them is close to minus 3 fourths A when B goes to zero. We do an expansion of that. We'll get minus 3 fourths A minus 1 sixth B. And then that will also have plus some higher order corrections. But if we compare that with our perturbation theory result, we see that indeed, we got an agreement there. And you know, you might ask, well, why am I doing perturbation theory if I can solve the problem exactly? We're doing it precisely so that you can see that when you go through this exercise and verify, you can see that the perturbation theory really works. It gives you the exact answer to the corresponding order. You're going to have some homework problems where you're asked to do this on the different homework problems. And you should work on them until you verify that indeed the perturbation theory actually gives you the correct answer when you Taylor series expand the exact answer to the order that you're doing the perturbation theory. If you don't get that agreement, then you've done something wrong. And you're not going to really learn perturbation theory until you can do that and actually get those expansions to be correct. Okay, with that, we have now reached the end of lecture 19. We'll see you again in lecture 20.